Good morning. My, uh, my name is Brian Massey, Member of Parliament uh, for Windsor West, and we're here today with uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, Cheryl Hardcastle, Tracy Ramsey, Helen, and Tulio uh, to discuss our long-term care. Um, there's been many issues to challenge us as a nation under COVID-19. Um, I've been very impressed um, to be part of a New Democratic Caucus that has worked really hard under the leadership of Jagmeet. For those that aren't aware, Jagmeet um, was also uh, raised in Windsor and Essex County here, um, but he brings a progressive voice to politics and the expectation of caucus members to bring solutions to Canadians, uh, not just to call the government out on issues, but to offer proposals to better our future. And so today we're going to talk about our senior citizens, myself as a PSW, um, and some training in Huron Lodge. Um, I can tell you our most vulnerable um, in our society should be the way that we actually measure and judge ourselves and how we treat them and keep them as part of our community and culture. So again, I'm turning this over now to Jagmeet and to say thank you, uh, Leader, for being here again in Windsor Essex County and following up um, again as usual. Uh, and welcome home. Uh, again, thank you for your leadership and actually ensuring that we have a unified caucus that works to get results. Again, being progressive and offering solutions is where we want to go as a country. And that's where you're bringing us as a leader. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, really honored to have you on the team. You've been a powerful voice for Windsor and a powerful voice for people. And thank you. And your experience as a personal support worker is absolutely critical when we talk about what is one of the most heartbreaking parts of this pandemic. The pandemic has hit all of us. Everyone has been touched in some way and it's been really tough. It's been hard to see lots of our friends and close ones lose their jobs because of the pandemic. Small businesses have been forced to shut down. And we know that there are a lot of us that have lost loved ones in this pandemic, people very near and dear to us. And for a lot of people, it's been a lot of uncertainty, just what's going to happen next, a lot of un unknown and, and a lot of worry. But what has been the most heartbreaking part of this pandemic has been the fact that seniors, mostly in long-term care, have borne the brunt and the pain of this pandemic. Seniors have been more likely to get sick and seniors in long-term care have been those who've lost their lives. And it is so wrong that the most vulnerable in our society have borne the brunt of this pandemic. So we've called on a solution. We put forward a platform, of what we would do if we were in government to immediately change this, to immediately save lives. And what are the, the first and foremost biggest calls from all experts, everyone agrees that what we need to do immediately is get profit out of long-term care. Profit has meant that cost cutting and cutting corners has left seniors without the care they need, less staffing. It has, mean that, it has meant that food uh, quality has been cut. It also has meant that when the military came in to Ontario and Quebec and they released a scathing report, cost cutting and fear of, the, of, of making the bottom line meant that uh, in long-term care homes, seniors were uh, the victim of the same syringes being reused, expired medication being used, and seniors being left in their own feces for days on end. This is the direct result of for-profit. And so we've made a call and we are gonna to commit to removing profit from long-term care. It has no place in our healthcare system, but it certainly has no place in the care of our vulnerable seniors. We also wanna put in place a rapid response so that we re respond proactively whenever there is uh, any concerns, a crisis or an outbreak, we respond proactively with a team of, of experts and also be ready to have the military be deployed where there are uh, needs. We know that immediately putting in place paid sick leave is one of the most important tools to reducing the spread of, of infection in a workplace. And particularly in long-term care homes, this uh, paid sick leave is vital. So we fought to have paid sick leave, we need to make it better. We wanna to commit to you that we are gonna fight as hard as possible to protect our seniors, our loved ones. They deserve nothing less. And uh, to continue this, this discussion, we're gonna bring in some local experts I, I, or local champions. Uh, they're experts as well. And it's for me, it's a special honor to be back in Windsor virtually, but to be back at the town that I spent a lot of time I grew up in and uh, I really care about. So let me first introduce our first um, validator, our first speaker. His name is Tulio. He's someone who represents the workers who are on the front line. Some of these workers that are caring for our loved ones in, in long-term care homes. And so please, I invite Tulio to take the, take the mic now. Tulio. 
Thank you, my brother, and thank you to our leadership from the NDB party. Obviously, we're grateful that you're around and we're grateful and, uh, for the help that you give us. So I just want to talk a couple minutes and go back to where all this started, the way I feel it all started. I can tell you in January of 2020, we met with the Minister of Long-Term Care, Mr. Fullerton, and we told her that we had a big crisis in long-term care. We told them that we can't operate the way we were and the way we are in regards to short staff and then for the for-profit owners to think about the profit instead of the residents in these facilities. And you know what she told me? She told me, don't worry to it. We know all about it. We got this. Well, we got it all right. We're in a deep mess and it's all because of their inactions and we need to stop it. I'll tell you in Windsor, I'm not even a month after that, we had the major, one of the biggest outbreaks in one of our home, which was Heron Terrace. And I can tell you at that point in time, we had about a hundred people get infected. And out of the hundred people, I believe there was about 60 of them that were residents. And the unfortunate part, some of those residents died. I, I, I think it was around 30 residents that died. But if it wasn't for Mr. Muji, the CEO of Windsor Regional Hospital, we took it upon himself to open up the field hospital and we were able to bring a, about 40 residents in there and that saved lives. But that was the first pen, first wave. And we all knew we were going to get into a second wave because and all the experts talked about it. And what did these homo, homeowners do, especially the ones for profit? Nothing, nothing at all to the point that once we hit the second wave, we were still fighting with them in regards to PPE, a simple a tool that they need, these the, our staff, the people we represent, in order to protect themselves and protect these residents. And what happened? We're fighting them over masks. We're fighting them over gowns. We're fighting all of that. It's a shame. What they did is unacceptable, and nobody in this whole country should have to do, go through that again. So we fought them over the masks. We fought them over the PPE, but we still had a lot of people die. And I'm talking one of our home without mentioning the name, we all know she was one of the biggest outbreaks. And I think it started around November. But I can tell you as of today, 58 residents died in that home, 58 residents. And now you know what that equates to? Two whole floors that have no more residents in them. Wow. Two whole floors. So one, Premier Ford said he's going to build these new buildings and he's going to have all the staff. First of all, I don't know how he's going to get staff because the way the, res the, the workers are treated, nobody wants to go in this field because these for profit are not worried about them or the resident. They're worried about the bottom line. And that's got to change. And I'm glad you got a perfect plane, my brother, because at the end of the day, we need that. We need leadership. We need real leadership that says we respect these residents to the point where they have to be treated with dignity. And then we go into, we've just had a major fight with another home, another for-profit home, where we're still fighting for PPEs. A smaller home, about a hundred beds, which is, that equates to about a hundred residents and maybe a hundred to a, uh, about a hundred uh, staff. I can tell you as of today, 92 between residents and staff are affected are in, infected with this virus. And we got to fight about proper masks? I can't believe it. So I, it, it hurts me, it bothers me, but because I hear it every day in regards to what's going on in these long-term cares. And our residents, our family members should not have to die. There's a lot of them that are dying that shouldn't, be, shouldn't die because if they did their job, if these homeowners cared about the residents before they cared about their stockholders or their profits, a lot of our, a lot of our family members will be alive. And maybe I could tell you a story because this is not gonna end when the pandemic ends. This is a war, just like the, our veterans, they're still dealing with the wars of the past. And that's what's gonna happen to our members because they're scarred, they're mentally need help. I can tell you a little story about one of uh, my, most seasoned PSW. What really gets them is when they go in there because they formulate a family with these residents, especially now where family members can't go visit. And when they go in there, they sit in their car, they're crying. They're hoping that that person that they're taking care of 
he's not going to die on their shift because that's a reality of life with this COVID. And when they go in there, they, and if that person happens to die, now they have to make sure that that body is taken care of. They have to do that. They have to turn around. And the sickening part, and I don't want to be, I don't even like to talk about it, but it's a reality and people have to understand this. Now they have to put them in a body bag where they have to wheel them outside. Can you imagine us doing that to our loved ones? I can't imagine doing that to my mother, my father, my brothers, my sister. Here our members are asked to do that. And they go in and they do it because they love what's going on. They love taking care of people. But I can tell you these homeowners, for private homeowners, they can have all the mission statements in the world where they care about the residents, they care about the staff. They don't care. And it's you're absolutely right, my brother. We have to change that. We have to eliminate these for-profit homeowners, and we have to bring the dignity back to our residents and to the people in this country. So I want to thank you. I appreciate you. And I know that you're going to do a great job and we need leaders like yourself. So thank you very much. And thanks for allowing me to speak. It's, uh, it's hard, but at the end of the day, it's something we got to discuss. And the reality is, is that our loved ones deserve a lot more than they're getting today. Thank you. Thank you, Tulio. Really appreciate your words. I know you've been fighting for, for workers and for the residents for a long time now. Uh, thank you for representing these workers with uh, honest, uh, raw voice and telling people exactly what's happening. So thank you so much. And thanks for standing up for the workers and for the for our seniors in long-term care. I wanted to go now to, to Helen, who uh, is going to share a personal story uh, about what, what long-term care means to her and her family. So again, thank you so much, Helen, for agreeing to, to be able to share your story. And I pass the mic now to you, Helen. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so my dad is 98. I'm going to try not to get emotional. He's been in long-term care for about four years now. Um, and we're a very, very close family. So prior to the pandemic, we were in there every day. There was always one of us in there every day. Um, you know, just talking with him caring for him, holding his hand, hugging him, kissing him, you know, just having good conversations. Um, once the pandemic hit, we were completely locked out. Uh, for months, we were locked out. Um, and that, that was hard because when this all started, my dad was okay. He was, you know, as best as he could be at 98. He was ambulatory. He could carry on a conversation. As the pandemic wore on, he just started, he started to deteriorate. Um, he could no longer ambulate. He requires a lift. Um, yeah, they would FaceTime us. But it got to a point, you know, initially, early on, he would say to us, why haven't you been here? Are you mad at me? And we'd have to try to explain to him that we just weren't allowed in. So when things started to open up, it was great, um, but the province had put out specific recommendations, specific guidelines for these homes to follow to keep the people safe. The home that he's in went beyond that. And I feel that they put precautions and restrictions in place that were just not necessary, way too restrictive. My sister is a nurse in the States. That's common, we're a border city. That, that's a lot of the nurses in this town. Um, she was told that she would not be allowed anywhere near the building. And even if my dad was palliative, she would not be allowed in. My sister hasn't seen my dad in almost a year. We've reached out to everybody, anybody that would listen to us to try to get some help, to, to, to talk some sense into these people, to get some sort of answer as to why the restrictions are so tight. And I'm telling you, we don't get the response or the, or the explanation that we need. Um, you know, we're very fortunate. We're in one of the better homes. Um, my dad's PSW is, is a true, true angel sent from heaven. She, you can tell she loves her job. She loves these people. She builds these deep relationships with her residents. She knows exactly what they need. Um, but she's tired. And I can, I can see it in her face that she's tired. 
They're constantly working short staff. Um, and there's nobody to even call in. And the few people that they might be able to call in don't want to come in because they're part time. They don't have benefits. There's no incentive for them to come in. And even when they do come in, they haven't. And I don't know why these homes can put in such restrict, such strict precautions and keep family members out. I'm the only one that can go in there. So I'm the one that goes in. I'm the one that sees how tired these people are. They're mentally drained. And not only is it a difficult job on a good day, now put, put a face mask on, put a face shield on top of that. You know, um, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just awful. And, and really it's just a, uh, it's a conversation we need to keep having. And we don't have time. We don't have years and years and years to implement changes. Changes need to happen now. And the, the, the consistency of care needs to be there. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible. I hear you. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you for sharing uh, your very personal story. And I think you, you've given voice to a lot of people that are feeling what you're feeling right now and really appreciate your concern and care for the personal support workers, the frontline workers, all the workers that keep the long-term care homes going and, and how hard it is on them and, and how they're asked to do so much with so little. So thank you for, for your voice and for your story. Uh, thank you for everyone who's joined us. We, we've heard from Tulio who represents frontline workers, Helen who shared her, her personal story. And again, we wanna say that our seniors deserve better care. The first step that we're calling for is to immediately remove profit from long-term care. Our seniors should not be faced with cuts, lack of the proper care, lack of proper, proper staffing, just because a long-term care home wants to make a profit. That is wrong. Profit, for-profit care has no place in our healthcare system. It certainly should have no place in the care of our seniors. So we have a clear plan to remove profit, a clear plan to provide immediate help so that workers or earn a, a good wage, a good salary, have the hours necessary to provide the care, that there's adequate staffing levels, because we know the staffing levels and staffing quality work, the quality of, the, of work for workers and, and pay for workers is directly related to the care for seniors. There is no uh, denying the evidence that shows if you have enough workers who are paid well, who are able to work in one facility, they provide uh, excellent care for seniors. And when they're understaffed, when they're asked to do so much with so little, seniors are the ones that end up suffering. So thank you once again for being here. I now want to pass the mic to Nina, who will manage the questions from media. Thank you very much. So if you have a question uh, to all the journalists and media uh, on the call, please use the raise hand function uh, that is uh, made available by Zoom to, uh, to show me that you would like to ask a question and, and then we will unmute you to uh, ask a question. Uh, you, can, uh, you can identify who you would like to ask a question to um, and uh, we will answer your questions uh, respectively. Uh, respectfully. Um, so I will go ahead and go and start with Adele Wazel from Blackburn Radio. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, my first question is for Jugmeet. And uh, Jugmeet, as you know, this is provincial legis this is provincial jurisdiction, the long-term care homes. As a federal government, I, if you were elected, how would you get around that? Because uh, it's pretty clear that this is provincial in nature. Really appreciate the question. Uh, a couple of things. First off, when we speak to loved ones who have seen the horrible conditions in long-term care, they don't want to hear excuses based on jurisdiction. They want to see some action to save their loved ones and, and our loved ones deserve it. So we have to show leadership. And while we absolutely respect that there is jurisdiction, if we look back in our history to have universal health care in this country, it was federal leadership that made that happen. So there is, there is no excuse that at the federal level, we can't provide 
the leadership to see these things happen. And so there's a couple of things we can do immediately. First off with long-term care and to remove profit from long-term care, the second largest long-term care provider in all of Canada is owned by a federal agency, is completely owned by a federal agency, meaning the federal government can actually immediately make that public. So that's one step. Secondly, we've got the Canada Health Act and those same principles should be applied to long-term care funding and home care funding. Another way for us to ensure higher quality of care for seniors. And if we work with provinces with the funding that we have at the federal level, with a commitment that we acknowledge the evidence that for-profit care is killing our seniors, for-profit care is putting them in worse conditions, the evidence is overwhelming, then we can actually get the results of helping our seniors. So we absolutely need to work with provinces, but there is no reason why the federal government can't provide the leadership to get this done the way we did it when it came to universal health care. It was federal leadership, Tommy Douglas, as you all recall, who led the charge for universal health care, and we were able to achieve it. We can do the same thing now. For uh, Tulio, I wanted to ask him, uh, he mentioned that uh, 58 residents had died at one of the local long-term care homes. Is he speaking about uh, Village at St. Clair there? Just to clarify. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no. Tulio, I think you just need to repeat your answer. Trying to, uh, okay, hold on. Yes, I'm talking about St. Clair Village. We all know it's been well uh, talked about in the media and all that. That was one of the hottest spots to uh, of the long-term care facilities that we represent where the outbreak was just right out of control. So the unfortunate part, that is correct. That's the home and um, it's gotten a lot better and uh, hopefully they, they stay that way. Thank you for clarifying that. And Helen, uh, can I get your last name? I'd rather not say that on the uh, on the air. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next question. Uh, we have Julie Kutsis with uh, Windsor Star. One question, one follow up. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Hi there, actually Adele asked my question, so thank you. Okay, thank you okay. so much. So I would like to re-invite uh, media, if you have a question to please use the raise hand function at the bottom of the page and uh, we will allow you to ask your question. So I'll just wait an, uh, just a few seconds to see if there will be any more questions. Adele Wazal, I see that you have another question. Please go ahead. Would it be possible to unmute to ask your question? Absolutely. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll start <laughs> over again. Um, Doug, I, mean, I just wanted to ask you to clarify a couple of points about the, the task force that's going to sure, be set sure. up to transition to not-for-profit in less than 10 years. That's a pretty tight time frame there. So I guess you tell me a bit about uh, what needs to take place, what this task force needs to do. Certainly. So it is a very bold plan. It is, uh, it is a monumental task, but I believe that there's momentum now uh, after seeing how horrible things have been for seniors and how horrible it has been in for-profit long-term care homes. The evidence is undeniable. So what we're uh, going to do, there's a couple of steps to this. First off, we're going to uh, immediately make Rivera public. That is owned by the federal agency. And then to broaden that to get rid of all profit and long-term care, it's going to take a number of steps. Uh, one of the things that the task force will do is to gather all the learnings from this pandemic, what has worked, what are best practices, what has not worked, gather those to establish what are national standards, what are the best practices to care for our seniors, establishing those. And then as I indicated before, with the Canada Health Act, we wanna make sure that funding for long-term care goes along with the same principles of the Canada Health Act. So if we're spending uh, money on long-term care, it should all go towards the care of our seniors. There's lots of steps that we can take in order to uh, remove profit from long-term care, but we have to acknowledge that we are right now spending money that goes into the long-term care system 
where some of that money ends up in the pockets of shareholders. It ends up in the pockets of those private owners of long-term care. And that is wrong. We want all dollars to go towards the care. So what we'll look at is moratoriums on new beds that they have to be uh, not, they cannot be for profit, the new, any new beds in Canada. Uh, increasing funding directly to long-term care to support provinces, working hand-in-hand -hand with provinces to uh, be able to expand the amount of care that we can provide with long-term care and with home care while we are working towards a goal of removing all profit from the system. It is monumental, but we're looking at the evidence. It is crucial that we do it. Again. Look, I did it again. I'm sorry, I had to unmute again. Now, okay. that moratorium on the new beds, uh, we have an aging population right now. These beds are in high demand. Right. Uh, a moratorium on new for-profit beds is one of the ideas that's been floated uh, around how we can get profit out of the system. And that's something that I'm open to, the idea that any new bed has to be uh, publicly delivered or not for profit. So those are those are some of the tools, but the task force will be given this task that we need to establish a path to getting rid of all profit. And we've got some of the key steps in place uh, that we propose in our plan, making sure funding follows the same principles of, of the Canada Health Act, which as, as folks will recall, is how we got rid of private hospitals. Private hospitals, a lot of folks said we can't get rid of them. There's, it, there's no way we were able to win that victory and help uh, pave the way for universal health care. We can do that with long-term care as well. It's been something that's been ignored for far too long, and our seniors have, have borne the cost of that, that negligence. We can no longer let this happen. And so we're going to fight to make sure seniors are cared for, profit is removed, workers have good pay, good uh, solid positions, good conditions of work so that our seniors are cared for. Thank you very much. Uh, I see no more questions. Uh, so this concludes our press conference. Ceci met fin à notre conférence de presse. Jigmeet, if you'd like to uh, close, please go ahead. Certainly. I just want to thank everyone again. Thank you so much to Leo and Helen for sharing your stories. Uh, thank you to all the, the journalists for their questions and for showing interest. And for all of you that have covered these stories, thank you so much. And to the families that have lost loved ones, to the families that have loved ones in long-term care, to the seniors who often aren't able to raise their own voice. We see you, we hear you, and we are fighting for you. You deserve better care, and we're not going to stop until you get it. Thank you very much. This concludes the press conference. Thank you again, everybody.